It was a strange feeling to be a priest in March of 2020. I walked out to celebrate the weekday mass and the people were crying. The small group of people gathered there. They said, we just heard on the news that we can't gather for mass anymore. There can't be any gatherings. It's too dangerous. And I said, well, we're here now, so I guess we'll just do this celebration and then, and then we'll be done. And so it took a couple of days for it to dawn on me. I thought, the first thing was, I was like, whoa, then no one's going to receive the Eucharist. And then I thought, oh, and we're not going to come together at all, which means, oh, there's, there's going to be no community. And then I thought, and that means there's no collection basket. <laughs> and then I thought, the staff can't come to work, and that's good because there's no collection to pay the staff. So it just started dawning on me deeper and deeper levels of realization. And so what we did is the staff started doing these conference calls together. And we were sitting in our own homes in front of a big map of the county. And we were plotting on the map where the parishioners lived based on the parish census. And then we called the parishioners and we said, do you know that there's actually another parishioner just living on the back side of your block? And did you know that on the cul-de-sac around the corner there's two other families living there? And we said, would you like to gather in your backyard with the readings of the week and just maybe sit 20 feet apart and talk about them together in March? <laughs> and they all said yes. And some of them said, well, I don't know if I feel safe being around people. And I said, well, there's this new thing called, I'm not, I can't remember the name of it. It's something, Zoom or something. Remember when that was new to us? There's this thing called Zoom. I think you can meet on that too. We can try to get you information about that. And they all did it. And it's funny because I had heard about small groups for a long time. I had read the book Rebuilt when I was in the seminary. And I had heard about how important small groups were for parish life. And it was on my long-term to-do list of things we should really work on. But it was one of those hard, heavy lifts that was probably going to take a while to figure out. So I didn't, I didn't do it. And all those people that we called, do you want to meet in each other's backyards with strangers in March? They normally would have said, no, no, thank you. But we were all scared and we were lonely and we had nothing else to do and we couldn't come together. And so that's how small groups were born. And I don't know if there's anyone from Koksaki or Ravina watching on the live stream today, but I would bet that they would agree with me that that is what saved our parish through COVID. A lot of parishes are not bouncing back from COVID. You probably know that or have thought about that. But those parishes are going strong, I think in large part because of small groups. I'm not sure if any parish has done better with small groups than ours. St. Mary's at our peak in Lent had 150 people in small groups. That's just incredible. 150 people. Think about that. What that does to a parish. Now some people do it in Lent or in Advent, a time like this, a special time in the church year, and they say, you know, I kind of want to take my faith a little more seriously right now. But some of them do it more than just seasonally because they've fallen in love with it. And so they're like, I don't want to live without this. And and they, they keep going. Now, the third commandment requires that we come to church on Sunday. That's, that's a commandment from God. But small groups are not. That's not something we're asked to do by God. So why are people doing it? I think it's related to the longest road trip that I ever went on. Which, I've never done a cross-country one, but I've done from Toronto at a friend's house to visit a mutual friend on the coast of New Brunswick. We did that in one day. Whew, I'm not sure if I'll ever need a longer trip in my life than that. There were three of us in the car, 
and I would say that for the first 10 hours, it was lots of fun and we were chatting and, you know, and then it got kind of a little old. And so we started doing things to divert ourselves. So uh, for a whole hour, we only talked in a Southern drawl. Then the next hour, we had to only talk in an Irish brogue and talk about the trip that we were on. And then that got old. And then we were getting real sleepy. And my friend who was driving said, please do not sleep. I can't drive if you guys are sleeping. I'll fall asleep too. I need you to stay awake so I can stay awake. You've probably had that experience. I need you to stay awake so I can stay awake. And I think that's exactly what was going on with those small groups in COVID. We all felt like, am, am I the survivor of this? Am I the, am I the only member of this parish? I don't have any proof that anyone else is out there. I don't get to see them. I, small groups provided the chance for the companionship that kept us awake. A lot of times here in church, I will hear people say, any parish I've been in, Father, we should have a Bible study. And I support that. I think a Bible study is a great thing. After all, I mean, I, that was what seminary was in large part, Bible study. Learning about the Bible in depth. What does this Greek word mean? What does this Latin word mean? Tell me about the Syro Mesopotamian culture. That's all good. But it's not a small group. And it doesn't have the potential or the power that a small group has. Now, that's no knock on Bible study, but by the word study lets you know what it's all about. It's a chance to learn more, it's about learning, and it's very good. And many people would really like that. But Bible study is not going to do for the parish what small groups do. Because you can really hide in a Bible study. You can sit in rows. And they can, they can write the Greek word up on the board. And you can get away with not saying a word. There you are writing in your notebook. And you leave and you don't know anybody any better than you arrived. And, and, and you didn't really necessarily work on applying that to your life. But a small group doesn't let you get away with that. There's no hiding, in a sense. You sit in rows in a Bible study, but you sit in a circle in the small group. And the goal of the small group is not to learn things, although you, you definitely do, but it's to grow. It's, it's mutual growth. And so if you've been talking about the fact that your loved one has been in hospice these months and people have been hearing that every time you read the scriptures, you're putting it through the filter of that experience, well, when that loved one finally goes home to God, you're going to have a team of people that really knows what you've been going through. They're not, they're not wondering what it's like for you. They know full well exactly what this is like for you in this experience. Now, I got to say, as we have been reflecting on 175 years here at St. Mary's, I've been reading through all the old uh, literature and memorabilia, all the articles that we've saved, all the books. And when you have a history as long as this parish has, it can feel like there's nothing new under the sun. That can sometimes feel that way. Anything that we're doing now, I look back and I say, oh, Monsignor McDermott had to face the same kind of thing in 1875. But there's something going on right now in our generation that's a never before. And it started in Rome. It is this idea that Pope Francis had that I want to hear from every Catholic in the world about what their experience of church is right now. I want to hear from every Catholic. Now, that's a billion people. That's never been done before in the history of humanity, to get a billion people to share a lot of us are asleep about that. We don't even know about that. Oh, I've heard about that. What is that? Synod? That's a weird word. What, what is that again? Where? When? What? That's, that's what Jesus is talking about when it's like, no, no, people, come on, stay awake, stay awake. That's a big deal. And our small groups are, are our version of that here. That is something that's never been done. 175 years have come and gone, but it's only now at this time in history we're figuring out that a parish this size to stay strong has to have little communities within the big community. Otherwise, we'll stay anonymous with each other. Interestingly, we have a lot of questions about the future of our parish right now because there's so much going on 
Diocese is bankrupt, parishes, some are shrinking, some are closing. So we're like trying to figure out what is the future for St. Mary's? And the way that we're finding out is going to the small groups. Many of you who are in a small group know the staff divided up all the small groups that we have and we went to your homes or we went to the meeting room here if this is where you meet and we sat with you and we asked you, what are you, what are you excited about at St. Mary's? What are you worried about? What, what concerns you about the future of the Catholic Church in Glens Falls? What, what ideas do you have about what we should be doing right now? That's never been done before. Parish staff going to people's homes to collect data and then bring it back to vision and that's never been done. So the question may be for each of us, what are you and I doing to stay awake? Because it would be easy to just roll over, especially this time of year, you just want to roll over and say, wake me up in May. It's going to be a long winter. Wake me up in May. But no, that would be a mistake. Jesus says, I need you to stay awake. What do you do to stay awake? Is it a prayer routine? Is it getting a little blue book and making a commitment to that for Advent? Is it something else? Is it volunteering in the food pantry once a week? Or volunteering in our school library program so you can be with kids at this formative age? Or our school lunch program? Are you someone who took a tag off of the giving tree and you're staying grounded in the reality that there are so many people struggling that don't have the blessings that you or I might have? Small groups might be among those ways, one of the most effective ways to stay awake. Because a lot of people told me they loved the book Holy Moments. That was probably the crowd favorite here. People loved Holy Moments. And if you think that book was good reading it on your own, the experience of reading it with a community that, that really cares about trying to live their best life, that's a whole nother level. It feels important to remember that in just 25 years, our parish is going to be 200 years old. And we have a responsibility to hand on a parish that's stronger in 2048 than it is right now. And I can't imagine a better way for us to do that than with small groups. Because that's how the sharing happens that makes life possible to live. Because the, the weird math of a small group is when you share your joy with other people, you wind up with twice the joy. And when you share your burdens and your sorrow, somehow the math works out that it's cut in half. Let us consider what we're going to do this Advent and down the road to stay fully awake.